Hey everyone! I've just finished writing my new book about game development in Godot, which means uh, the time I had for coming up with new shaders was once again very limited. But I do have something after all. It's simple, it's fast, and it could even be useful. Let's take a look at how we can create yet another blur effect. So, just like almost every time, I'll create a new scene, drop in uh, the usual image from our game, and apply a shader to it. Let's like right click to the scenes folder, create new scene, uh, user interface, call it circular blur, okay, and here is the image I always use, let's drag it to the 2D editor, so the Sprite 2D uh, node was automatically created, and in the inspector I'll cancel the centered region, and in the transform position let's reset to 0, 0. Very well, <clears throat> and of course we have to scroll down to the material section, create a new shader material, click it, and create a new shader which is of a type shader mode canvas item and the name is circular blur .gd shader and I'll put it to the shaders folder create and click again to open it in the shader editor which I expand a little bit and as before we'll start by deleting what we don't need in this tutorial so that only the fragment function remains so I'm deleting vertex and I'm deleting white very well. Okay, so how is this going to work? The principle of such a blur is to divide a circle into equal parts and shift each pixel in the corresponding directions, created by slicing the circle into pieces. And since a single pixel shift isn't enough, we'll repeat this algorithm through a large number of iterations. So let's start by adding two uniform parameters. The first one, which we'll call blur power, will define the intensity of the resulting blur. And the second one will define the number of iterations. So uniform uh, float blur power with a hint range and the initial value zero, no blur. And let's make it from one to 10 with the step point 01. Okay, that's the first one. And now uniform float it uh, rations, another hint range, and the initial value would be 50. Okay, and the hint range is from 1, as we don't want zero iterations, and to let's say 100, and the step is this time 1, of course. Okay, and now let's move on to the fragment function. This time we are not creating any symmetrical effect and we don't even need to recalculate the aspect ratio. So the beginning of the code will be unusually straightforward. And let's simply write vec2 uv is uv. Cool. And since the value of the blur power parameter is too high, to be adjusted conveniently with a slider in the inspector, let's work with a much smaller copy of it. So float blur is blur power times 0 0.05. Okay, let's define a variable for the final color into which we'll gradually add the results of individual iterations and then the loop itself where the calculations will take place. So vec3 color is vec3 and let's start at zero black color and now the loop for <coughs> float i from zero to iterations uh, iterations i plus plus and the body of the cycle. Okay, and what do we put inside the loop? As I said, 
will apply the blur effect in directions determined by dividing the circle, which corresponds to a vector made of the cosine and sine of the respective angle. Now, the angle of the whole circle is twice pi, or tau, which will multiply by this angle so we can cover the entire circle. I'll call this vector circle <laughs> and it will look like this. Vec2 circle is Vec2 and as I said cosine of tau, the full circle, times i divided by iterations. And similarly, I think I can copy and paste to make it faster and change it to sine right and semicolon. Okay, next let's define a vector shift which represents this pixel offset and for now we'll just assign it the value of the circle vector so we can see what happens when the shift is always by a constant distance. Uh, vector shift is circle times blur. All right, and finally, we'll get the pixel color and add it to the color variable. We shift the coordinates by the shift vector and take only the RGB components from the result because uh, since the color is a uh, vector three, so that would be this line color is increased by the function texture applied on the on our texture, our background image, and the coordinates UV increased by the shift vector and RGB, of course, because function texture returns a vector four, including the alpha channel. And of course, uh, we are performing plenty of additions. Iterations are set to 50 by default. So the result needs to be normalized. Otherwise, it would be overly bright, almost white everywhere. Normalization is done by dividing uh, by the number of iterations. So outside the cycle, color is divided by the number of iterations. Very well. And now we can assign the final value of the color vector to the internal variable color in capital letters is vector four, uh, our color, which is vector three and the final component one for the alpha value, alpha channel, I mean. OK, at this point, we don't see anything. Uh, we don't see any change because the blur power is set to zero. But when we increase it in the inspector, we'll start to see the artifacts I was talking about. So let's expand the shader parameters in the inspector and the blur power increase. Can you see it? Yeah. Maybe something like this could be useful for a certain type of effect, but we definitely won't settle for that. Before continuing, let's take a look at how the final image is actually formed. So uh, let's set this to one, for example. And when I change iterations to one, uh, we see the original image shifted to the left by blur power. If I increase, we can see the shift. Yeah, let's get back to one. This makes sense because in the loop, we uh, the variable e, variable i, I mean, it will only have the value of zero. So uh, cosine of zero is one and sine of zero is zero, meaning a horizontal shift. So let's increase the iterations to two. And now we get two copies next to each other, each at half brightness. Changing to three, we have it in three directions or four, four directions and so on. So let's return to the default value 50. That's how those circles or rather ellipses are formed. And to get rid of them, we'll introduce a pseudorandom factor into the algorithm. It's based on a function I copied from our earlier tutorial on creating a lightning effect. The function takes a vector two as input and returns a float, which is why I called it hash one two. So let's scroll up and put it above the fragment function, just pasting. Here it is. 
so now we can add a new variable noise inside the loop which uh, will store the value of this function and will increase it by the blur variable to make it uh, to make the blur even blurrier so scrolling that and after the definition of the circle vector let's do this float noise is our hash function one two and it takes a vector two as the input parameter sorry vector two and the arguments would be i and uvx plus uvy and as i said we will add <coughs> the blur constant to make it even blurrier okay the values on the vector uh, uh, for the hash one two function that is this i and uvx plus uv y simply mean that in each iteration and for each pixel we get a different pseudo random result we could just as well use a minus here or multiplication or any other operator all right so the last step is to add the resulting fluctuation into the calculation of the shift vector right here so let's multiply that by noise weight okay i would say we've achieved a pretty solid result uh, we can try adjusting blur power and observe how the image becomes more blurred or sharper so increasing now it's totally blacked out and getting back and this is the original image yeah and we can also try to work with iterations now it's grainier now it's finer okay yeah of course uh, this can also be controlled via script which lets us achieve interesting effects in our game such as uh, total fade out or fade in the structure of the blurred image may not be as smooth as with the gaussian blur but the computation is much faster so it's definitely a good and usable alternative solution Thank you so much for watching and I hope I once again uh, added something useful to our shader collection. Of course, I'll also include this effect in the Godot shader pack, which has already grown quite a lot and the number of shaders in it will soon reach 100, which is a milestone I have set for myself. And since in five days from releasing this video, I'll be launching both my game and my new book, the next video might be a bit in that spirit, or maybe not, and instead I'll come up with a new shader. We'll see. Anyway, take care. Thank you once again for watching. I wish you the best of luck with your projects, and I'll see you in the next video.